Hi, this is Paul. I've been talking a lot about proximal betterment and ultimate betterment, and I've been trying to piece some of these things together with some of the material that's been going around. Peterson has been working on a similar thing, aspiration, attention, worship. Um, if, there's, if your life can be a little bit better, can it be a lot better? What do you have to do to get there? Wisdom, self-improvement have been a huge been a huge growth industry. This isn't new. I've read before the beginning of Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. And in The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard opens with the discussion that was happening in the in the mid 80s when people were beginning to fess up to the fact that taking a course on ethics at Harvard University won't necessarily make you an ethical person. To throw on top of that, we're with pluralism not only being conceived of as something out there, but something now that we are living in the middle of hyperpluralism and the grasping for some communal agreed upon narrative and ethic. The the crisis of this continues to um, continues to play out among us. Now, Peterson, of course, uses all of these dead reckoning, um, now more calling them proximal betterment strategies, in order to say, well, with a with little bit of A-B testing down around you, uh, having a satisfying job is better than having a, an unsatisfying job. Having even an unsatisfying job is better than losing your apartment or going bankrupt or feeling meaningless or purposeless of not having a job. Um, having a better marriage is better than having a worse marriage. Perhaps having a marriage is better than being single. That's, of course, something that's very much being debated right now. But th these are all sort of A-B testings for proximal betterment, and we're trying in that sense to scale up wisdom from these A-B testings. But, but if you do this far enough, you begin to realize that these things really do have to scale up a ways because the um, someone will say, well, doing this thing that makes me feel good now, even if it's in the long term, if it's not in my long term best interest, blowing all my money at a casino because I have it in my hand, out, um, overspending all of my credit cards right now because I've been given the credit and not worrying about when the bills come due. I mean, these are all things that humans do, but we can see far enough down the road that say, okay, maybe not having credit card debt is better than having credit card debt. And these questions get very, very difficult as they go out. Now, adding to this, the, the iron box of secularism, where there are no longer stars that guide us that we believe in, and we're stuck with the stars of Hollywood and their disordered lives to guide us. Um, you know, if, if there's anything that, that would tell the tale of our of our lack of seeing stars to guide us, it would be using the stars of Hollywood to guide us. Um, and, and we keep looking to nature to give us an ought, but that's exactly what the Nazis did. They looked at nature and said, well, you know, the weak of the herd are culled by the predator. So be a predator. Get rid of all of these mitigating human structures that are standing in the way. Read um, Timothy Snyder's Black Earth. And, and so we're dealing with these questions of, of proximal and ultimate betterment, which, which very quickly get into questions of category, such as what is a human being? What is a good life? These are all the questions of wisdom that we're, that we're dealing with. After World War II... It was the West looked at itself and said, yeah, um, that social Darwinism, that didn't turn. We don't like the way that looked in terms of what they saw happening in Germany. But especially at the end of the Cold War, the Christian ethic that continues to guide even the likes of Sam Harris to one degree or not or another or 
continues in some ways to fuel the deconstruction of 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 many people when applied to various things such as gay marriage or um, all sorts of social issues, you know, certainly. And perhaps no pregnancy is better than an unplanned pregnancy, so abortion is the answer. Well, there's a great question of proximal versus ultimate betterment, because is it better for me to abort the child? How about the child? Is it better to abort a Down syndrome child? or to bring the child to term and raise the child. It, it's questions like these that the the proximal betterment strategy really sort of um, is, is found wanting, and we're looking for greater scales, scales beyond my own limited life arc. Hmm. I didn't do that video on King's North yet. Maybe I'll bring that in right here. So because of the... Um, because of the, the details of this little corner of the internet, many of you have seen the Rebel Wisdom interview with Paul Kingsnorth. And of course, Kingsnorth has been on Jonathan Peugeot's channel, and Kingsnorth has a rather vibrant substack, and Kingsnorth has the uh, cross and the um, machine article in First Things that I mentioned in a video not too long ago. And... What was it was fascinating the the is Christianity on or off the table for many people and and rebel wisdom you know obviously they have their certain niche but their you know their history of doing men's work um, they're all sort of part of this wisdom seeking subculture and whether or not Christianity is a viable option seems they seem to flip back and forth with it you know when jordan peterson in 2017 2016 2017 when jordan peterson first arose i think i think for david he he saw christianity as maybe a viable option and 2018 2019 oh didn't really see christianity as a viable option and then paul king's north comes along and what's so compelling about a narrative like king's north is that he is not a dyed-in-the-wool conservative. He was a hardcore environmentalist. He, he, he has bona fides from sort of the left, and yet he then converts to one of the more, one of the more conservative expressions of Christianity. You know, when, when Vin Armani does so i think people sort of write those kinds of conversions off because they say well his life was so chaotic that of course he would need some strong medicine to um, stabilize himself and 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 set his life straight i've never been able to find the mark maron episode where mark maron who of course interviews celebrities uh, usually celebrity comedians, once made the observation that it's it's really the screwed up people that go to Christianity because they need something really strong. In terms of proximal betterment, a lot of the people who are who are less chaotic and less messed up, well, they can kind of just maybe go to rehab or something and, and settle down to be sort of nice, progressive Hollywood liberal types, but it's it's the people that are a real dumpster fire that that have to become Christians. Now, I'm not calling Vin, Vin Armani a dumpster fire, but, you know, in terms of public record, his life was pretty disordered. And I've had a conversation with him. Now, Jonathan Peugeot has had a conversation with him. And so people might look at Vin Armani and say, yeah, you know, you were kind of a dumpster fire, so it would make sense that you would go to orthodoxy, sort of like, um, um, what, what was the guy's Roush V, who went to orthodoxy, and recently he did a conversation, you can't find it on YouTube anymore, but you can find it on um, BitChute, with um, Milo Yiannopoulos. I mean, it makes sense that these kinds of people go to Christianity, because they need really strong medicine to curtail their, their wild selves. But Paul King's North, he's a writer. He he could, you know, he could keep a marriage together. He could hold down a job. Why would he need this brand of Christianity? 
And so suddenly when Paul Kingsnorth converts, people then are, oh, oh. And it's fascinating watching this interview and especially the questions. And this, this question grabbed my attention. Quite a bit. Uh, the second question about the... Um, which, one, which one do you prefer, Terry? I think the second one. Um, yeah. First, Paul, I really, really appreciate your sharing about your journey. Uh, and because, and, and you know, if, um, if Russell Moore shared his journey, it wouldn't be on Rebel Wisdom. You know, Russell Moore, someone of the church who's been there. Now, I've been on Rebel Wisdom. I, you know, I'm not trying to strawman them or anything. But again, it's, it's, the, it's the narrative of King's North's life with respect to kind of a, a communally imag a communally shared imaginary that that myself and rebel wisdom i mean i'm i'm in that sense you know i'm sort of classic idw and that when mr reagan asked if i was conservative i it's like I, I, nobody's ever asked me before if i was conservative no nobody ever at least in my little circles in the christian reform church nobody ever nobody ever thought of me as a conservative so now, I understand that on broader spectrums in the culture, I would be considered a conservative given my um, embrace of small orthodoxy and my, my embrace of the physicality of the resurrection and, you know, my stance on abortion, yada, yada, yada. So in many respects, I could be considered a conservative, but I was never a conservative in the Christian Reformed Church. But Paul King's North still, in many ways, is Paul King's North a conservative? I mean, he's in in some ways he's still a radical environmentalist, but now he's also orthodox, and and that sort of scrambles people's imaginary, which have kind of been formed by the 1980s and the rise of the religious right and how that's been portrayed and manifest in the news. So you know, she well, I'll I'll take this woman at her word that she you know appreciated Paul's presentation. It's it it. I relate to it, and it's it's compel it's fascinating, it's intriguing. So thank you so. Much. Now I got to be really careful because I don't know her, and I don't know her story, and I don't want to presume to know her. But the the question she asked was very interesting. So much. Uh, how do you see from inside orthodoxy? Do you see it um, either orthodoxy itself um, having a different relationship with the social issues of the day? All the stuff we blame Christianity for, is there a way that, Christ, that orthodoxy is more or less guilty? Here we go. That was a fascinating question. Is there a way that... So, so Christianity is to blame for all the stuff that we're blaming Christianity for today. Christianity... Well, we'll let her finish because he asked for clarification. That's um, part one. And part yeah. two, individual orthodox folks. Do you see a difference in how their Christianity plays out in their lives from what's in, in other words, she, within her question, she's got a question of both proximate and ultimate betterment. And, and she wants to know if Christian, if Orthodox Christianity is outperforming the kind of the baddies of Western civilization who, who brought the patriarchy to you and who brought, um, heteronormity to you and who, you know, who suppressed gays. I mean, is so, so maybe orthodoxy is this strange new form of Christianity that we've never heard of. And, and maybe now with that on our scene, maybe we can become Christians again because, Hey, we kind of already have the buildings and we already have the Christmas songs and we already celebrate Christmas and Easter and, you know, all the sunk costs, maybe just this, this other brand of orthodoxy, that this other brand of Christianity that we've never heard from, that, that, will, that will solve all the problems. Now, of course, anybody who just pauses and maybe does a little bit of a survey of some of the varieties of the, the things that the Orthodox Church did and participated in in Eastern Europe, let's say the Russian Orthodox Church, and it's, its cozy relationship with the czars, let's say, um, and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus because, I mean, this, and, and Kingsdorf will basically go to give an answer like this, but, but the very nature of the question she's looking for is, is there a betterment path here? Well, let's listen to a little bit more. Um, 
Yeah, well, maybe you could be a bit more specific on the first question of talking about sort of social issues and problems and things. Have you got specific things in mind? So all the stuff you hear about, uh, uh, you know, the patriarchy, the wars, the, the killing of indigenous people, all that stuff. Are you going to tell me that's that was all Western Christianity who did that? Well, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to tell you is that humans are all fallen, and so we all do this stuff. That's what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> for starters. So I'm not going to put the Orthodox Church on a pedestal. Um, it, it is true that the Orthodox Church didn't lead any crusades, uh, and uh, they didn't do a lot of the stuff that the Western Church In fact, they got beat up really bad by one of the crusades. Church did. Although you know, the Orthodox Church is responsible to, for some pretty terrible things in the past in Orthodox countries sometimes. Um, I, I don't know of uh, any faith tradition that is not responsible for things like that. Even the Buddhists are at it in 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 Burma. Um, the atheists, obviously, uh, in, in in Russia and China are at it or were at it. The Muslims are at it. There's not a there's not a religious tradition or indeed ideological tradition that doesn't involve some people wanting to kill or oppress others in order to force it onto them, which is a human manifestation. That doesn't excuse anything Christians have done. I'm not interested in defending terrible things that have happened but it's not certainly not unique to christianity it's a way that humans behave um and it tends to be a way that humans behave certainly in the christian tradition right that's the thing you can only do if you're not actually following what you're taught to do by christ there's no way you could behave like that if you were actually listening to the sermon on the mount properly it's not actually very complicated we know that there's no justification for a, a holy war or any of these other things um, and there's not any justification for forced conversions or any of the other stuff that's happened. So when you, it, it's and, and you know his, I want to be really careful with something like this because number one, this is part of the the weakness of a of an anecdotal approach to questions like this. I mean, here's one guy he's converted, but. Because he's converted, we sort of put him on YouTube and expect him to have answers for all of these questions. And these are actually really complex questions. So, you know, I and some of you will have opinions about his answer, and that's fine. But again, the the questions have to do with betterment and, and the looking around for, well, maybe there is a maybe there is a religious tradition, maybe there is a set of practices, maybe there's maybe there is something that can can guarantee us betterment and a guide that we a guide something that we can pursue for wisdom and for betterment and and that it's not just proximal betterment but the proximal betterment scales out and and again you know back to questions like abortion well is getting an abortion a good idea well maybe it would have been better not to get pregnant if if you're not in a position to adequately raise a child or i mean there's all sorts of questions that that come to that and the way life goes you know my my wife is um my wife was adopted and she was born in the in the mid 60s and so you know she she feels fairly strongly about abortion because she she says you know if if abortion had been legal and present her mother was not a christian uh, her birth mother um she would have been aborted instead you know her mother was sort of snuck off to you know one of these homes for pregnant girls her mother was a teenager and you know had the baby and then you know sort of disappeared for a few months while she had the baby and gave the baby up and then reappeared back in high school well what about proximal betterment there and, you know, but then, you know, years later, when my wife and her birth mother were reunited, um, there's a lot of joy. But that joy is complex. And so these these betterment questions, whereas we're always sort of tempted to take them as A, B, well, right here, right now, the further they get away from us, the more difficult they are to answer. And, and so, well, maybe maybe there's another version of Christianity that was that was different. And maybe that version will will help us. Well, the difficulty is that part of what happened in the loss of the discarded image was we, we, we sort of lost who, who us were. So I haven't done much with uh, Tom Holland's podcast lately, but there are a couple of episodes recently that I thought 
were helpful to the conversation. One of the episodes of Napoleon in Egypt, which is as is typical of the kinds of stories that they usually pick out for the rest is history, just a, a really interesting story. Napoleon in Egypt is one of these moments that we've had in the modern world of a enormous culture civilization gap being suddenly bridged and forcing both sides to sort of look at themselves. And these these all sort of when when these moments happen, proximal betterment and ultimate betterment questions sort of get really dramatic. So Napoleon has come to Egypt. Um, Napoleon has conquered Egypt. Napoleon can't hold Egypt. Napoleon sort of skedaddles back to Europe. But Napoleon, when he came and conquered Egypt, brought all of these um, all of these scholars because suddenly Egypt then was was on the world stage as wow this this new uncharted mysterious glamorous um, civilization that you know nobody really thought of or was invested in and so then when Napoleon sort of has to ski daddle back well then suddenly the people in Egypt begin to recognize oh my goodness we are so far behind the times I mean similar thing happens in Japan when Admiral Perry's fleet rolls in suddenly they realize we are way um you know, we, we, we can't stand up to these European powers. They have technology, they have military technology, they have economic power, and of course that puts Japan on a on a path that will, you know, lead to the Second World War. But this this example, and of course with the perspective that Tom Holland's gonna bring to it, well, let's listen to some of this. The Romans started putting up obelisks to remind themselves of how they been captured Egypt, and and so that there's a sort of weird kind of classicism in that yeah. as well, isn't there? Yeah. So, so, so the sense that um, the Greeks and the Romans had ruled Egypt, uh, and now the Western powers should should equally have a stake is is definitely a part of what's going on. But conversely, um, just as uh, people in, um, in in Europe are getting obsessed by Egypt, the Egyptians are, are very very conscious of basically just how how technologically advanced the French had been relative to, say, the Mamluks. And one of the things that Mohammed, Mehmet Ali, Mohammed Ali does is, as part of his process of, of, of uh, modernization, is to send Egyptian savants to Paris. And there's this one guy, Rifa al-Tatawi, who, who um, wrote a brilliant account of his trip to, to Paris. Um, and the, again, there's this sense of... Um, you know, as as with Napoleon going to Egypt, the sense that he's struggling to get a handle on a very different way of seeing the world. So likewise, with Al Tatawi, he, so he describes France as a land of infidelity and obstinacy. Um, <laughs> one of their bad customs is their claim that the intellect of their philosophers and physicists is greater and more perceptive than that of prophets. Um, and now, now, when you have these moments like this, and immigrants go through this. You know, if you get together with immigrants, let's say, come to the United States, especially if they have to come sort of as refugees in, in California, a lot of Vietnamese and Hmong and Laotians came, you know, in the wake of the Vietnam War, Afghanis come. I mean, immigrants will come and they'll they'll complain to high heaven sometimes about all the all the stuff they can't stand in the new country, but they're not going back. And but but it's so that sort of scrambles this proximal and ultimate ultimate betterment gyroscope well and and they because they've been formed by this other culture they these 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 individuals go to france and it's like oh, france they think their scholars are better than than our prophets our prophets have heard heard from god but these scholars you know but yet why did you go to france and and that it's in these moments that that suddenly the you recognize that that proximal and ultimate betterment and the and the ways that they connect the ways that they scale all the way up to the top well, these are these are pretty important things
Um, and there's there's, uh, there's 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 a, there's a French observer of these Egyptians who've come to Paris to study, and he's so so. In other words, these guys have come from Egypt to study Paris, and there's a French observer who's been watching the guys from Egypt to come to Paris. And of course, the guys from Egypt looking at Paris, they have their own opinions, but the Parisians have their own opinions of these people who are coming. He says of them that um, the only things that they learned to do in Paris was to speak passable French, to drink wine. And to laugh at Mohammed. Oh, really? Fascinating. So this is very kind of, is it um, the guy Kutub who went to uh, America in the 1950s? Is that right? It's a kind of weird echo of that, isn't there? Well, Tatawi is, is, is more enthusiastic. He comes back to Egypt and he's, he um, founds a, a kind of a, 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 a European language centre. Right. Uh, so that people can learn languages and kind of translate treatises and industrialize yeah. and improve agriculture yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's going on. But but essentially it it generates tensions within the traditional model of Islamic culture. Yeah. That, that that are enduring to the present day because the thing is that up until Napoleon lands at Alexandria, basically nobody in the Muslim world had bothered with what the infidels were doing. And they just had no interest in them, couldn't care. And now, now again, you find this in Asians, who in the in the nineteenth century are suddenly, you know, oh, here's the here's the Europeans, and and twenty early twentieth century they have nineteenth century they have gunboats and they have you know, look at their military, look at their navy. We, you know, it's like aliens came down and landed. Of course, you had that dramatically in the Americas with the the Spanish. Um, con- conquest of the Americas, and you know, and 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 you have this all the time, and and so suddenly these this this chain of betterment, proximal to ultimate, gets gets completely scrambled, and because the worldviews that we have are these are these fabrics that are knit together of of many many strands, and then suddenly they're just they're just ripped open, and and. And you have to sort of piece one together. And in some ways, part of what's happening now in our civilizational struggle is, you know, we see the fraying of it, and but but we don't quite know how to the ultimate and the proximal betterments how the how they can connect. It, it it's assumed that that Islam is able to structure everything, and essentially the shock of realizing that that is not the case. And what do you, how do you do that? Do you try and integrate Islam with the kind of the trends that Napoleon and then the other European powers embody? Do you reject them completely? I mean, what do you do? These are tensions that are, are enduring throughout the Islamic world, throughout the 19th and 20th century, into the 21st century. And of course, as so, so there's one, one of the comments of Tatawi when he goes to Paris, he says there's not a single Muslim settled in Paris. I mean, that is clearly no longer the case. And so those those arguments and those tensions have to be resolved by Muslims who are now living in France. But they also, and you can see that the, what's going on with the presidential election moment in France. These are issues that are now dominating um mainstream French discourse as well. And as you say, that it's a particular issue for France, isn't it? Because I think it is, yeah. France has that kind of sense that Napoleon himself had of the kind of secular, rational, enlightened a Frenchness being bound up with secularism, with liberalism, um which they as you say, they think of that as something outside um religion. But I have a terrible feeling, knowing you, that you will say that is actually a product of their of their Christian heritage. Am I right? Yeah, I'm absolutely going to say that. <laughs> of course, I, you are. I, I'm absolutely going to say that because it's it's clearly true because because the French are exporting, you know, deeply Christian assumptions about the possibility of church and state being separate entities. I mean, you know, there's no equivalent to the phrase church and state in your fluent Arabic, as you'll. <laughs> well, of course, of course not. Tom, um, what about this? Um, what about this uh, Edward Said? And, and so, you know, here we are. And I just did a video, the the whole left, um, the whole in the culture left where the church used to be. I mean, these are all the issues that we're, that we're dealing with. And the we like to, in a secular culture, talk about betterment as, as something that, 
we can simply arrive at from all well, science as and but then of course you have to look at and see that the science does flow out of Christian Europe and there's there's a lot flowing through this river of history that is is terribly difficult to sort of well this is religious and this is that and this is that like it just the world just doesn't hold together like that now i want to jump to their episode on neanderthals because in some ways the the hope that science offers is to to get at the universal and prior to a couple of decades ago, maybe the thought was that, well, with psychology, we can get at the universal just if we take these college students and test them that, you know, then we'll find out what, what humans are, not realizing that, well, all of these college students also are located within the river of history, and there's all sorts of development like that. And so then we get at questions. Now the, the current fashion for, and if you look at Chris Williamson's channel, the current fashion is that, well, it's evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology. And so now we, we want to sort of get at the, the, uni, the universal human being via, via biology and natural selection. And, and that'll be the way to, to look at those patterns and then we can understand. But then, of course, you have the, the conflict of the scientific image versus the manifest image that scientific image doesn't tell you what ought to be it just sort of tells you what is and and this really jumps out in terms of categorizations about what on earth it means to be human and it was the discovery of the it's not even the discovery because they had you know neanderthal bones had been found by generations of people before but it but it's only in a certain period of time that that they get that they get discovered and identified and it's within our culture that they get placed within a certain timeline and i'm not going to play the whole episode of neanderthals but what's fascinating about this episode is that every, we keep looking at them while we're looking at us and when we need them to be knuckle dragging you know apes they can be that when we need them to be you know, have as much culture and language and basically to be our, our equals, we can, we, we picture them in that way. And of course they're not here to tell any story and the fragments from them are just tiny little fragments of them. And, and of course the categorization, we can't help but see them, but through categorization. Because geologists like Charles Lyle were arguing that actually you know, the Earth history went back millions of years. And so some people did speculate that humans could go back a long way. But it was the Neanderthal, Neander, Neander Valley skeleton that really started this debate about ancient humans that were potentially different from us. Chris, the, in The Origin of Species, Darwin famously does not talk about human evolution. Uh, and he does then go on uh, in The Descent of Man to talk about it. How unsettling is the discovery of, of Neanderthals to human conceptions of themselves and how does it kind of feed through into i don't know kind of ideas of um scientific racism hierarchy of races and things like that that really kind of takes off after after the origin of species yeah so of course it it does get drawn into that debate so so huxley uh, recognizing that this was large-brained he in a sense saw the neander valley skeleton or the, the skull in particular as being one end of a long chain of humans that was you know neanderthal with very large brow ridges at the other at one end and then moving through you know some more recent human finds and there were more recent human finds that had bigger brow ridges than others so for Huxley, this was one end of a long chain of uh, of humanity. Uh, so I suppose, you know, he would have argued it could even be an extreme form of Homo sapiens, our own species. Uh, but then there were other people, as I say, who named it as a distinct species. William King described, you know, really quite a lot of pr very primitive and you could say bestial features on this Neanderthal. So straight away, there was a debate there about was this just a different kind of modern human? Or could it be something really different and with the ideas of evolution much more primitive? And by the time we get to the 1900s, of course, no really ancient fossils have been found in places like Africa. So the African fossil discoveries that we know about now, those only started to appear in the 1920s. 
much. You really get the sense of this of of this of this this moving target. And and in terms of the register, science loves to just say, "Well, we're right up here and we're looking down on the world." And so these are but you're using language. These are humans. Okay, well, when you use that word, there's lots of other things that are tied to that word, especially after Christianity. Because this this radical egalitarianism that's that's deep within our ethical system. Because once you once you designate someone human, well, now suddenly they have rights. It's sort of like, well, you know, once you once you bring a terrorist onto um, mainland USA, well, suddenly all of this all of this legal machinery and and rights are available to them. So keep them over on Guantanamo. And, and and we have all of this placement of, well, h- how do we think about these things? And, of course, this has everything to do with, well, how on earth do we think about us? So in the early 1900s, people were looking for kind of so-called missing links. Yeah. And there had been a find in Java uh, that we now know is a Homo erectus. Uh, and that was really quite ape-like. And the Neanderthals were also in that debate. And some of the reconstructions of Neanderthals made them very ape-like. And this is fascinating, too, because you see some of the same things going on in terms of dinosaurs. You look at some of those very early dinosaurs, and they all sort of look like alligators with very long legs. And now you have the question of category. You have the question of fact and narrative. The narrative, as it were, is that this is a lizard, so kind of like an alligator. So then the facts, you you fit the facts to fit the narrative. Um, or you have the formal, you have the form that this is an alligator. So and then you find these others. Okay, well, the Neanderthals, they're these knuckle-dragging cavemen who, who maybe grunt and don't have language. But I mean, this is all going to be debated. They were depicted as being bent-kneed, yeah. uh, grasping big toes, very hairy, head hung forward, not walking fully erect. So there was that debate going on about them being really an ape-like form of human, a sort of missing link. Um, whereas, you know, now, of course, the, the debate about Neanderthals has moved on. I think it's, it's much more difficult to say the Neanderthals were even culturally inferior to modern humans who were around at the Okay, now watch the language. Inferior. We have a value. Same time. So the, the behavioral gap between Neanderthals and us has narrowed. Some people would say it's disappeared. Um, and I think there is this risk of, of, you know, getting them into this debate about inferiority and superiority. And it's part of this misconception that, you know, all these human forms were evolving to be towards us, that we were some kind yeah. of perfection of humanity and everything was evolving to be like us. And if they evolved to be like us, they were successful. And if they didn't evolve to be like us, they were unsuccessful. So right away, value is just shot through this. You have a telos. While they were evolving toward, we're the telos, we're the end, we're the goal. And and so now, you know, he's trying to pull back from these kinds of ideas, but we find ourselves, we find ourselves going to them. So there is that debate as well. And yes, it does link into this idea of superiority, well, you know, modernity, you know, the fact that we're so numerous around the world, um, and apparently so successful means that some people see us as the kind of height of evolution. Now, now, of course, you can't... The word success, that's the product of a value judgment. That you have some image of, of telos and we're closer to it. That's more successful than others. And so then it's the question of, well, in Peterson's system, he wants to use Darwinian truth. He wants to use sort of Darwinian metrics, but, you know, there's a lot of debate there. Well, does, can Darwinism talk about success? How, now, then we get into essence, and then we get into um, factors. Is is numerical, you know, and actually he's going to get into this. I should let him talk because he, he talks through this, which is why I wanted to play this one. Uh, whereas, you know, I'm a paleontologist in a paleontology department, and I, you know, I see us as just, another form of animal in a sense with and, and you know he says that now but if i would knock on his door and put his wife in a collar and um tell her to go pee in the backyard he would be horrified she's not another animal she's my wife oh 
well, what's going on here? Very successful in numbers, but whether we're successful in the long term, we're, we're newcomers in evolution. Could you not then, though, say that we, we clearly were more successful than Neanderthals? And I love Dominic's, Could can't you say that we're clearly more successful? I mean, look at us. We've got clothing. We pee in the house. We wash our hands. We use knives and forks. We, you know, you know whatever metric, we, we've, we've built computers and the internet and electric lights. Clearly, we're more successful. Well, he's going to throw the question back at him. It's truly really marvelous. Um, as evidenced by the fact that there are an awful lot of us and there are none of them. I mean, would that be too simplistic a way of, of putting it? So another Darwinianly, well, they're, they're a dead end. Well, were they a dead end? Well, was their dead end, what, what, did, did we cause their death? I mean, they're getting into, again, I'm not going to play the whole episode. I'll have the link to it down below. And, you know, it's, I, I think the rest is history is an absolutely, uh, it's one of my favorite podcasts. But um, these questions are just all over the place. And they're not in any way disconnected with all of these questions of wisdom and proximal betterment versus ultimate betterment versus is, is there telos in the structure of the world or is there not? Uh, well, it's one way of measuring success, but if you were measuring success in terms of numbers, then things like bacteria um, or other, you know, other other forms of life would be more successful than us. Right. And obviously, you know, if we look at the way our planet is and the health of our planet at the moment, uh, you could see that our success might seem great, but, uh, you know, how successful we'll look in a few thousand years. Yeah. And, and okay, so health of the planet, and he's, he doesn't address it directly but he's talking well sustainability if it goes on its own now maybe we we muddy up the atmosphere with our co2 emissions and we fill the oceans with our plastic and we degrade but we intercept an asteroid that comes to destroy the world so how do you make value judgments against that so on one hand we've got dirtier oceans and dirtier air and dirtier land but if we hadn't been here, you know, the dinosaurs weren't able to send Bruce Willis and, you know, Ben Affleck up to up to stop the up to, up to stop the asteroid strike. And they, they, they got got by the asteroids. So very quickly, you see how, you know, what a what, what a what a t tremendously complex game this is. It is another story. So in geological time, as I say, we and the Neanderthals are newcomers to the story. Um, and I think... And, and of course, then we can go to, like, stories of old, his skepticism about story in general. Well, you can't help but try and... If you're going to make evaluation with this, that the kind of way we're going to do it is through narrative. You know, Homo erectus, on conventional views, that species of human lasted for at least one and a half million years. So we've got a long way to go to match that yeah. in terms of longevity. So I think it depends what you measure by success. Is it just about numbers? It's also about your effect on the environment, how successful you are in the long term. And I think there's, you know, there's certainly doubts about how successful we're going to be in the long <laughs> yeah. term as a species. And, well, maybe we scotch this world and we get off another one, you know, um, Eric Weinstein's, you know, oh, we've got to get off this rock. Jordan Peterson's, of course, less um, pessimistic about our stewardship of the world long term. Um, but again, is it, what what is what is a river supposed to be? You know, here in California, we've, you know, there's salmon populations are not what they used to be and you know we've got the rivers dammed up but you know that those you know, we have hydroelectric power which is cleaner than obviously coal or or many other forms and we have uh, agriculture in the central valley and we can feed people and so you know proximal and ultimate betterments and goods these are tremendously difficult things to evaluate yet yeah, evaluate we must and evaluate we do well, so Chris, picking up on that, um, one of the reasons why I, um, I, I quoted uh, Becky Rag Sykes's wonderful book with that thing, Neanderthals First Kindled History. So this is a history podcast. Does it make sense to think 
of Neanderthals as offering us as Homo sapiens a kind of an alternative sense of how history might have evolved. Um, because you're basically saying that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens constitute kind of two divergent ways of being human. And if we if we have... And again, just keep watching the language in this. ...history, and it's made up of how we interact with one another, how we interact with the environment, how we've kind of developed a culture over the course of the millennia. Can we say the same about Neanderthals? Did Neanderthals also construct something that we would recognize as a kind of historical culture, perhaps? Now, now again, do we, do we look at it from the artifacts they leave behind? Do we, do we try, in a sense, to mind-read them? And if they have moments of wonder and complex thoughts and all of these things, then we evaluate them differently than if it's just, you know, killing and eating and doing stuff. I think it depends how you define history and culture. Uh, um, I think that obviously these people were surviving at the time with... Now again, they're categorized as people. What language are we going to use? Would... With a culture. They had a, a whole suite of features and behaviours that they passed on through time. So in a sense, they were creating history in that way. They probably did tell stories and pass them down. They probably had language. Modern humans did too. And it's not just about even us and Neanderthals, because we know there was another kind of human over in East Asia called the Denisovans, and they're a third kind of human. And in fact, looking more widely, in the last 100,000 years, there were at, last, at least five kinds of humans around on the earth. And, and of course, then you have to ask, and they will ask, you know, well, what's what's the definition? Because I mentioned before, you know, the almost every group in the world had us and them so jews and gentiles barbarian and greek in the navajo dine and those you know those who are of less value than us we have civilization and i'll get back to the you know the in egypt before napoleon landed well we're we're the center of the world and then napoleon lands and oh my goodness they we, they 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 mopped us up in a minute before Admiral Perry's fleet, you know, lands on Japan. Oh, we're the center of the world. Now suddenly, we if we're going to compete with the European powers, we'd better start getting the natural resources of China and um, using China to, to build our empire, of course, leads to the Second World War. So it's not even just us and Neanderthals. There were all these different experiments in how to be a human. Uh, we're the one that survived, the others disappeared, and, and obviously one of the big questions... And, and of course, to say that, experiments on how to be a human, and you sort of whoop, up to the third personal and look down and say, oh, okay, well, you we got these, 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 these creatures in Africa, then we have these creatures in Northern Europe, and then we have these creatures down in the, you know, Southeast Pacific, and these are experiments. Boy, does that, is that world la word laden with an observer is why are we the only ones left of all these experiments to be human as a complete outsider can I ask a quick definitional question um so we and neanderthals and denisovans for example are all human but what is a human is it just a particular kind of ape or, or what, what is the definition yeah that's that's a good question and and there isn't agreement on experts so for me the gen so we're going to ask experts and they're going to tell us or or maybe we should ask the prophets and and they'll tell us homo so we're homo sapiens the neanderthals i call them homo neanderthalensis um membership of the genus homo for me is what it is is what is being human and being in that genus uh the representatives have larger brains they have a, a human shaped body they have technology um and and so on so there are certain features in the skeleton that that we can pick up in fossils to determine whether something's human or not now for some people Human is a term they would only apply to Homo sapiens, our own species. Um, I, I find that a bit worrying because it means Neanderthals aren't human. Um, Do they care? Why are we worried about hurting their feelings? What, 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 what role are they playing in our hearts and lives and in our image of ourself? 
And as we're going to come on to discuss, no doubt, um, we have interbred with the Neanderthals and with the Denisovans. And again, we. Well, who's 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 we? I I have any of you bred with a Neanderthal? Now, some of you might look at your husbands and think he's a little Neanderthal-ish, but um, we. And, and again, we have these categories. And so, in a sense, that means we, as humans, didn't in, we, we interbred with non humans? I, I think that's really pushing the argument. Oh, and now suddenly we have a reputational problem. It's in a, in, a, in a strange direction. So, for me, membership of the genus Homo means human. So, yes, we and the Anatoles are, are Homo, so we are human. So, I'm, I just see them, as you say, as a, another model of human, another way to be human. In a sense, we've maybe we got lucky. That could be why we're here and they're not. We lucky. Just got lucky. Certain things happen in our prehistory that helped us survive and that and in the Neanderthal's case things turned against them. But we should bear in mind with all of this that they're not completely gone. Yeah. And of course we'll come on to this, but yes, they're physically extinct, uh, and may have gone extinct around forty thousand And again, it's the category but, but you know, back to the Verveki, well, where are these categories? Are these categories out in the world or are these categories a matter of perception that we're, that we're projecting upon them? A thousand years ago, physically, but they live on in our, in our DNA. So, you know, each of us now in this, in this podcast have Neanderthal DNA around the level of probably 2%. Right. So, you know, we've all got a bit of Neanderthal in our DNA, and that's true for the majority of people in the world today. So the Neanderthals have not disappeared completely, and neither have the Denisovans. Their DNA lives on in uh, billions of people today as well. The way that Neanderthals have been understood since they that they were first discovered. So as you said, to begin with, they're kind of cast as savage. And, and again, just following the language in this, and I'm not criticizing it. This is the only way we have to talk, but since Neanderthals were discovered well wait a minute i thought they were in us how 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 did we discover them what what exactly did we discover (laughs) brutish ape-like and then am i right that i mean for instance in the in william golding's book that dominic mentioned the inheritors um the inheritors are homo sapiens and and we see the, the the world through neanderthal eyes and I, I'm get, I mean, I'm guessing I don't know enough about the, the book, actually, but I'm guessing that it's kind of influenced by um, decolonization, the idea that uh, a kind of anxiety about Western colonialism, yeah. perhaps. Well, it's Golding's sense of humor. Well, now, now suddenly we're, you know, we're categorizing all of, you know, the world besides Western Europe as Neanderthals as and then we're feeling guilty about that. And. It's time to check my fantasy football team. Hang on. An evil, Tom. That's what it is. It's kind of yeah. humans are, are cruel and corrupt and, and the Lord of the, the Flies yeah, and things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Chris, am I right that in the 60s at a site in Kurdistan in, in northern Iraq called Shanadar, which is one of the great sites for, for Neanderthal archaeology, a body was found, a Neanderthal body was found that seemed to be a grave and it was thought to be a grave because there appeared to have been flower wreaths laid there. And I, I gather that this is no longer thought to have been the case. But in the 60s, it, you know, the age of flower power, this kind of gave an image of Neanderthals not as brutish and thuggish, but kind of peace-loving, wiped out by the sinister intrusion of, of Homo sapiens. And, and now have we moved on from that to a position where we're saying that you know, what, what were the relations between Homo sapiens and, and, and Neanderthals? Presumably, if they're interbreeding, it, it, it's not either that one is preying on the other, necessarily, but they might have kind of interacted. Yes, I mean, if we can come back, if you can come back to that particular question, and I'm going to go back in time about this whole question of the image of the Neanderthals first. So, yes, um, a reconstruction was made of a Neanderthal skeleton from France, from La Chapelle. Um, and this reconstruction really emphasized the dif- distinctiveness um, of the Neanderthals, and it was very influential. But the debate about the nature of the Neanderthals does go way back. So there was always this debate about human, how human they were, how like us they were. And the pendulum has swung backwards and forwards on this question. So after that reconstruction by the, of the La, Ch- La Chapelle Neanderthal, 
we find H.G. Wells writing uh, a story called The Grizzly Folk, where he really does paint the Neanderthals as being very distinct and, and very, you know, a, a sort of dark side, if you like, of humanity. Yeah. Morlocks. Yes, like the Warlocks. It's that yeah. sort of image almost. And Golding's is a reaction against that. So the inheritors paints them as like children of nature, um, relatively innocent in a way. Um, and it's, as you say, it's the, it's the modern humans who are the bad guys. And of course, that was, you know, if we look at uh, Lord of the Flies, you know, we've got that, that dual nature of humanity showing up, you know, humanity as being potentially cruel. And so the way the modern humans treat the Neanderthals is, is, is cruel. You know, it's a sort of genocide almost, you could say. Yeah. So yes, Golding is looking at those issues. It's the other side of the mirror. And as you say, they're moving on to the 1960s with Shanidar. Um, yes, uh, Ralph Selecki, who led the excavations at Shanidar, wrote a book called uh, Neanderthals, The First Flower Children, I think it was called, or The First Flower <laughs> right. uh, very much a book of his time. Uh, and yes, so the pendulum has swung backwards and forwards. Let's say we go on to the 1990s. I think the pendulum had swung away from that image of the Neanderthals to make them more distinct. You know, we had evolved in Africa. And there must be something about the African environment that gave us superiority. Uh, maybe we developed cave art and we developed sophisticated tools. And that led us to do well in Africa and then come out of Africa and then very quickly replace the Neanderthals. Um, and so that was the view maybe in the 1990s, the predominant view. But then as we get into the 2000s, we start to see the pendulum swing back again as more and more discoveries are made, which show that the Neanderthals were matching modern humans, let's say, 100,000 or 200,000 years ago in, in their complexity of behavior. And those discoveries are still coming through. And so now, as I say, the, the, if there is a behavioral gap, it's a very narrow one. And I think probably we should look at the Neanderthals as being very successful in their own right in what they did. And we were successful in our own right in what we did. We shared many behaviors with them, but there were some distinctions. Um, and I think that our survival, you know, probably was a matter of luck as well as perhaps being in the right place and the right time with the right little bits of behavior that, that gave us success. And it may have even been down to numbers in the end that the Neanderthals had been living in an environment where there were very severe climate changes happening repeatedly. Every few thousand years, the climate in Europe switched back from nearly as warm as the present day, to bitterly cold. These changes happen very rapidly, and they happened every few hundred or few thousand years. So I think the Neanderthals were never able to build up their numbers under those circumstances. So their diversity, their numbers were reduced. They had low genetic diversity. They had low numbers. And so in a sense, maybe they were already a threatened species. And then modern humans came out of Africa about 60,000 years ago, started entering the territory of the Neanderthals, and that may have eventually just destabilised them so much that they they just went extinct. Does that mean you could almost draw a map? Tom was talking about history, and and you know one of the way we don't just make sense of a history through stories, make sense of a history through illustrations and maps. Does that mean you could almost draw a map and you could say this these bits are kind of human inhabited, or sorry, modern human kind of Homo sapiens inhabited, and these bits are kind of Neanderthal territory or something? I mean, because you're suggesting that they're in different places, basically. Yeah, so we don't have the data to put them on the map at the same time in the same places, except in a couple of places. So broadly speaking, the Neanderthals were in occupation of Europe from... And, and again, I mean, someone would have to say our knowledge of this would be limited. But, you know, right away, 20 years from now, what will we think of them then? And this is, this is, a, this is a fascinating question. Now, in some of the videos that I've been doing, Paul Ann Leitner pointed out this video with Robert Keegan that Rebel Wisdom had done in May of 2019. This is a video that I had never seen, but very much in this question of betterment, because part of what Keegan notes is that up to Piaget, we thought that human development was something that happened in children, but then ended by the age of 20. And now we have all these other ideas of development. And again, nested in this, these ideas of development are, in fact, betterment. Now, the whole video I found to be very interesting. And I don't know how much more time I'll take this afternoon to, to dive into some of this stuff. But 
I'm, I'm tempted to treat the whole video because the whole video is, is worth treating, but I was listening all the way to the end and really the end of the video which just grabbed me perhaps more than the rest of the video. And it especially pertains to, to this, which is, you know, part of why I sort of thought about it and put it together with all of this. That's the $64 million question. The $128 million question is why are humans developing? Why are we doing this? And I want to just give you a quick glimpse of this here before we conclude. Because it's important for people to recognize that we are the only species on the planet living as long as we are beyond the years of fertility and reproduction. Okay, so you started out, they go through the whole interview and we're talking about see, see what happens with these developments like Maslow's scale and his scale and they were comparing it to integral ideas and integral tends to be more not just individual but social and Keegan has his critique of that and he brought up Jordan Peterson because it's 2019 and um, he, Keegan didn't think a lot about Jordan Peterson's take on Piaget and so I had some critique of that and then David um, David Fuller asked him, well, how do, how do we develop? And he gave, I thought, a pretty good answer to that. And that's the 64,000 64, or 64 million. And now he doubles it when he gets to this. I just turned the audio up because the audio on this was a little bit low as compared to the other. Um, you know, I use OBS now. I know Grizz is interested in this. Use OBS to try to level out the... Um, I've been developing too, because if you go back to some of my er earlier videos, the audio is a mess and maybe it's still not perfect because again, I make these videos up on the fly. I don't sit down, plan a video, have a script, do all of that. If I did that, you would never see a single video from me. I, I, I mean, I, I started with a little bit of a PowerPoint, but in that way, I'm not even, I'm now learning to do this without a PowerPoint script. Am I developing? I don't know. Ba -da -da -dum 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 -da -da -dum. The, um, the Muppet, the Muppet thing that Chris Pacal put in my head is is playing. So I should shut up and let Keegan talk. Most organisms finish their tissues because it, it's important for people to recognize that we are the only species on the planet living as long as we are beyond the years of fertility and reproduction. And when he said that, I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So was it, was it worth putting plastic in the oceans and CO2 up in the atmosphere and dirtying the land to do that? Most organisms finish their fundamental job of replacing themselves. And then now this this is all burdened with telos here, and this again reminds me of Sam's conversations with John Verveke. They perish, whereas we're living a whole generation now beyond the years of fertility, and this is something which humans have only recently come to do. We are today living, you know, most people died through most of human history in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and today we're living a whole additional generation. And that provokes the question, why is this happening? And the glib. Why is this happening? Oh, causation, final causation. Is this God's plan? Does God have a plan for us? Is, is, or is this just luck or accident or um, the, 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 the strangeness of, um, categorical mishmash. The answer is advances in medical science and reductions in poverty uh, are helping us fight the things that tend to uh, truncate our lives and so that's why we live longer. But that's a kind of a thin technical answer to a much bigger question which is not what are the means by which it's happening but why is it happening? And in the Western world where we have all this valorizing of individual autonomy if you feel satisfied by an answer that says this is this this species wide manifestation is just the consequence of a bunch of individual random choices uh, i'll leave you to that explanation but i want to suggest a different one which is when a whole species is collectively doing something you should pay attention to it and 
generally why does any species do which other species can pay attention to what we're doing we pay attention to what we're doing we would pay attention if the ants started doing this we would pay attention well the bi we are paying a, t a lot of attention to a virus which is doing stuff but again this is sort of human homo sapien us exceptionalism isn't it anything collectively and generally why does any species do anything collectively but then to survive to to succeed kind of evolutionarily to maintain itself and we are a species that is conscious of itself and we are living in a world which any person with their eyes open would have to say yes is a race to the top there are all kinds of extraordinary expressions of human spirit and imagination and generosity it's always so funny when we say it's human spirit why do we put that word at the beginning of the other word as opposed to well we're still sort of it's only 500 years in the rearview mirror that we said this is God's spirit in us that is doing this or other things or other spirits from below that are doing other things. But we are also living in a race to the bottom and there are all kinds of threats that are hanging over us that could, you know, wipe us out. And we know from developmental theory. And again, us, we, we use that word and we don't think a darn thing of it because it's a category that the higher state of development the self-transforming mind this ability to actually stand back even you know from our own uh, internal systems focus is a potential way of uh, handling the most lethal features of being a human being, these sovereignties of mind and state. So what if the fundamental reason that we're developing and staying alive so much longer than we ever did before is to create more of that order of consciousness that will enable us to save ourselves? Oh, wow. What if collectively we are living longer in order to solve the, the biggest problem of our survival that we face? Of our survival? Is it, again, it's not mere survival, meaning we will, we will end our lives for lack of meaning and we will end our lives for the sake of meaning for others. It, I mean, this Im imagining that this is just about survival, given what we have been doing in this world and are doing now, that 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 idea should be off the table because it, it's the bigger question in terms of what we mean by us and what us is and and all of our ideas of betterment and the, the we're not simply going to exchange ultimate betterment for proximal betterment because we know on one level that 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 is that is less than that is less than so yeah so these are all things i wanted to get out on the table and get out to you and i don't know if i'll put this out on friday or monday i am doing question and answer tomorrow tomorrow <laughs> maybe maybe i'll quickly do a live thing maybe i'll jump into the discord i i put a i put a little pitch pvk section in the little section of mine on the discord server if you've never been on it um because i'm continually that the randos thing is working pretty good but i don't always have slots but i also want to give people a chance to say hey this is an idea i want to talk about let's talk about it together and to find ways of doing those conversations so um yeah anyway th that's probably it for this video i'm going to jump onto the discord and um see if anybody wants to talk and um Thanks for watching. Leave a comment.